for this particular program on the Middle East, West Africa, North Africa, and the Sahel, uh, as some of our speakers who were supposed to be here had to leave for different reasons. So we have to do without uh, Miguel Angel Moratinos, the former Spanish uh, foreign minister who uh, you saw yesterday in the Latin America panel. We have to do without Fatala Sijilmasi, the uh, Moroccan diplomat and uh, former uh, president of the Union for the Mediterranean, uh, who would certainly have given, had, would certainly have uh, given an important input on the Moroccan perspective and uh, cooperation across the Mediterranean. And we also have to do, for reasons um, connected to the situation in his own country, without Farid Yassin, uh, the current Iraqi ambassador to Washington, who had to stay put in his embassy to give advice to his government about how to handle the situation for Iraq. Still, I do have a now much smaller but wonderful full panel with uh, four speakers who I will briefly introduce. Uh, we have Mohammed Ibn Shambas from Ghana, who is currently the SISG, which means the Special Representative of the Secretary General and the Head of the UN Office for West Africa and the Sahel. Uh, he has quite an experience in mediation and UN and AU peacekeeping because he also used to be or was the um, uh, AU, AU UN Joint Representative for Darfur uh, and among other positions he is a former president of ECOWAS, the uh, regional uh, organization for West Africa. We have, uh, aside from him, uh, Memdouh Karakulukju, he is a founding president of the Global Relations Forum in Turkey, which is an important think tank in that country. He's an engineer by training, which probably means, and an economist, which probably knows that he, or means that he knows what he's speaking about, at least we hope so. And uh, he will give us a Turkish perspective. Uh, actually, I think uh, his presence has become even more important through the developments of the last couple of days. We have at the end of the row, I'm uh, sort of going west to east, uh, Ablaziz Sagar from Saudi Arabia, also the founder and president of a think tank in his country, the uh, Gulf Research Center. In UN circles and uh, circles who are interested in mediating conflicts, he's also known as a person who has been moderating the Syrian opposition meeting in Riyadh, trying to get a unified delegation of the Syrian opposition for peace talks together. Now, we didn't have peace talks then, but we had the delegation at least. And we have, last not least, Dong Manyan, the vice president of the China Institute for International Studies, himself a specialist in Middle East issues, who, among other things, uh, has previously served at the Chinese embassy in Ankara, if I got that right. Let me briefly, before I enter into the debate, first with my colleagues here on the panel, uh, and then with you in the audience, try to set the scene a little bit. We are dealing with a vast area here. West Africa, the Sahel, North Africa, the Middle East, so that's a region from the Atlantic to the Persian Gulf, or the Indian Ocean, if you so wish. And if we are looking for one headline to characterize the situation in that vast area, it's probably the dissolution of order, and the dissolution of order on different levels, as it were. On state level, in a couple of, quite a number of these states in the region, be that in Libya, be that in Mali, be that in Syria, be that in Yemen, um, order being undermined either through civil war, through war, or through the uh, weakness of states which has undermined institutions and societal relations. But we also have a dissolution on order on a regional level as some of the regional organizations that had been set up in the last decades are disintegrating or not really working well. Uh, we still have something called the uh, Maghreb Union here in the Maghreb, but I don't think it is working in any way uh, as a Gulf Cooperation Council has been undermined by conflicts between the member states uh, as to what the Arab League does, uh, we can discuss. I think the only healthy organization among the regional organizations seems to be the African Union, but uh, 
we may want to discuss that at a later stage. And some people would say that there's also something to the, to the software of the region which we could call the normative order, which is being undermined through civil wars, through unrest, through the way that governments are dealing with their people. A normative order which always was difficult, but sort of was resting on a time-honored tradition of the coexistence of cultures that at least is being questioned in a couple of states or in parts of this region. Speaking geopolitically or strategically, if you so wish, we don't have a stable but a very shifting balance of power. We don't have a regional hegemon, but we do have various struggles over sub-regional hegemony, and we do have a high level of military or hybrid interferences into the states of the region, into Syria, into Iraq, into Yemen, into Libya, into the Sahel, by regional and international actors. Uh, I uh, would find it difficult to mention them all, but it's certainly among them. We have Iran and Israel, we have Saudi Arabia and Qatar, we have the United States and Russia, we have some Europeans and we have some others. Paradoxically, and that is probably something we want to discuss, the regional polarization, struggles for hegemony, non-cooperation, civil wars, and the weakness of states and institutions has opened the space very widely for external influence and external actors. And at the same time, and I think that's a paradox, the situation in this area has made international actors much more hesitant to involve themselves long time in a sustainable manner. That goes for the Europeans who in the past tried to engage in long-term transformative processes, Barcelona, Union for the Mediterranean, Southern Neighborhood, call it whatever you like, or even the Middle East peace process, which some Europeans still call that, Middle East peace process, or it goes for the United States, which of course was known for its long-term security guarantees which actors could rely upon. That is as much in question, I think, as a transformative engagement of the Europeans. My first question, therefore, um, and let me try to make this experiment. I would ask my four friends here to all answer in sort of 30 seconds in a yes or no or yes but and no but manner. My first question, therefore, would be, would the region be better off? Would it be less polarized? Would it be more at peace if we had less international involvement? In other words, should we rather let the states of the region sort it out, as Mr. Trump, President Trump, indicated in one of his tweets? Should we rather have the states and the societies of the region sorted out by themselves. Would we be better off here? Uh, Muhammad Ibn Shambas, would you like to start? In the West Africa and Sahel region, within the scope of the ECOWAS uh, in particular, uh, has been doing relatively well and uh, with you know, good support from partners to reinforce uh, many areas uh, in which ECOWAS has been trying to create a strong regional approach uh, to grow the economies, integrate uh, the region, but also in governance. And in all of these areas, it has indeed built strong partnerships uh, with the UN, with the EU, for instance, um, but also uh, with uh, the greater Middle East. However, uh, the new threats to the region, in the form of terrorism and violent extremism, if we see that as something that also has some external dimension, is certainly negative, and that the region could do better without that kind of uh, external uh, negative impact. Thank you, clear statement. We are going into more detail in, in around Memdu. How is that with the I mean, you're sort of on, on either side of the, of the question, in a way, uh, representing Turkey here, for better or worse, whether you like to be a representative of your country today, but you are by birth, as it seems. So um, 
would the region be better off with less of that interference from outside? Well, interference is a tricky word. Uh, Indeed. Sort of, uh, instead of interference, if we can say more constructive uh, sort of engagement, uh, no, it would not be better off without constructive engagement from external parties, provided that those external parties, particularly the EU and the US, uh, adjust to the new realities of power configuration, both globally and in the region. I will need to expand on that, but I can't do that in 30 seconds, so maybe we can get back to that. That's fine. Abdelaziz, uh, how is that with the external interference? Would uh, the region be better off without? Well, given the type of policies that the U.S. is implementing in the region, which is a very confusing, and also given the position of the other powers also, I think we will be happier without that intervention. What we need to see is a much more constructive engagement from their side rather than a destructive engagement, uh, which is taking place now. So it seems the bottom line for the three regional speakers is more engagement but less interference or another form of engagement. Now, um, Dongmenian, you happen to be the international representative here. We ha don't have uh, our European or American speakers here. So what do you think? How, do, how does it look from China, from Beijing? Uh, more interference is better or less interference is better? First of all, for I fully agree with my two colleagues. <laughs> we should change the terminology of, uh, from uh, interference to engagement or cooperation. Uh, I think this, the, the, new, the new terminology of cooperation is better than the terminology of uh, interference. Uh, personally speaking, I am uh, optimistic about the future of Middle East or the whole MENA region because the first, uh, all the regional countries and peoples, they hope this region should be a peaceful, stable, and prosperous, virus region. And uh, sh uh, secondly, I think since the so-called Arab Spring, uh, nine years after, but people in the region realize that they, 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 they are fed up with turbulences, fed up with wars, conflicts, and they even suffered from the rise of international terrorism and uh, extremists. So uh, they hope such a facade or scenario should be finished as soon as possible. Um, okay, let's, also, let's leave it. Uh, by, by the way, I think the, the even though to some extent, the MENA region uh, is so turbulent, but I think uh, the majority of the countries, they still focus on the domestic economic development. Thank you, I'm, I'm going to ask you for the specific role of China in a, in a minute, but let us try again from the people who are actually working in the region and coming from the region. Uh, Mohammed, in the last report, a briefing you did to the Security Council, you wrote and spoke of, and I quote, a worsening security situation in the entire Sahel. And you elaborated and spoke about banditism, terrorism, intercommunal violence. You also mentioned some progress on the governance side, democracy building, but basically you concentrated on the worsening security situation pointing to Mali and uh, Burkina Faso uh, particularly. So my question to you is, could you Give us a little bit more detail on the specific kind and the magnitude of the security challenges in that region and also try to tell us what organizations like the G5 Sahel or Barkhane or uh, the UN mission in Mali actually can do. Please, Mark. Well, there are two uh, areas to keep in mind here. First of all, the Sahel and then the Lake Chad Basin area. Uh, which are facing specific threats from terrorists and violent extremism. Uh, in the Sahel, the result of the situation and the activities of a terrorist group in north of uh, Mali, which has descended to central Mali, uh, and now is spilling over into Burkina Faso and Niger. We are indeed witnessing what uh, we have characterized as this 
deterioration in the security situation uh, in the uh, Sahel region. And um, evidence of it is the uh, almost now daily attacks mm. by terrorist groups in Mali, of course, particularly in central Mali, which has also triggered intercommunal conflicts because of the skillful manner in which the terrorist groups have influenced, inf infiltrated certain uh, communities, uh, uh, leading to an unfortunate characterization of the entire community as supporting terrorism, and therefore uh, the kind of attacks that we see, very unfortunate attacks that we see, for instance, in Mali, between the Pearl community and the Dagon. Uh, and then, of course, this has flowed over uh, into initially into Niger, in west of Niger, in the provinces of Tilabere and Taya, uh, which also are more and more witnessing the presence, the very active presence of these terrorist groups. Recently, and this has caused the entire region to wake up to this challenge, we have also seen uh, in the Sahel the phenomena of terrorism descending into Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso, which otherwise has been seen as a fairly stable, strong country, sort of a buffer between the Sahel and the coastal state, is uh, indeed uh, descending into mm -hmm. this uh, instability, uh, regular attacks while we were here. Uh, two days ago, there was an attack near Father Gruma, which has come pretty south, because this is one of the bigger uh, cities, towns in Burkina Faso, a little bit outside of the Sum and Sahel region, and uh, it's a crossroad uh, city linking uh, many of the countries such as uh, Benin, Togo, Ghana, um, and in fact uh, a major regional highway into Niger. So when cities like that come under threat, uh, then you see that this phenomena is expanding. So in general, that is the threat in the Sahel. But then, in, and, and this particularly linked to terrorist groups which have been known to exist in uh, north of Mali and have declared and do have links with international terrorist groups, Al-Qaeda, Islamic State, etc. Now, in the Lake Chad Basin, it's a slightly different story. You could talk of a homegrown terrorist group, mm -hmm. which Boko Haram uh, is, uh, having come out of uh, Borno uh, in northeast, uh, Borno State in northeast of Nigeria, and initially affecting six uh, northeastern states of Nigeria, and then spreading into Cameroon, into Chad, and into Niger, for instance, south of Niger in Difa County. Um, and uh, although it was seen as maybe perhaps just a fluke, it has shown resilience. Uh, in, the, in the campaign that brought current President uh, Buhari into power, uh, his strength and I think the perception that he succeeded in given was that being a former military man and you know rather tough uh, reputation from those days of uh, military governments uh, in, in West Africa uh, that he would take on and defeat you know Boko Haram. Um, Boko Haram recently celebrated his 10th anniversary and that more or less in the fifth year of the government of President Buhari. So it hasn't been that easy to fully contain Boko Haram. It remains effective in Borno State. I should say the progress has definitely been made because before it was at least six states in Northeast that were threatened. Today, uh, it's re Boko Haram's influence and effectiveness reduced to Borno State. So that's definitely progress. And um, certainly even in Cameroon, in Chad, we have seen that there has, uh, their influence or their effectiveness has been reduced and it's 
reduced to just predatory attacks on communities, on villages, etc. The response of the region has been in both cases. On the one hand, the creation of the JSEN Sahel uh, as, as a community of countries facing this existential threat from terrorists, violent extremists in the Sahel. And they have uh, been able to organize, to, to seek to address the phenomena in a comprehensive way, more or less along the lines of what the UN advocates, that it should be a total approach, mm. not just a security approach, but also address root causes. That means address uh, the poverty and sometimes exclusion and what uh, Professor Robert Dosso has talked about, the governance deficit, that in, in some of these countries, because the territories are so huge, whether you take Mali or Niger or Chad, and, and the government itself, the question of state capacity is so limited, uh, its presence has not been felt uh, in some communities. And then, let's face it, there has been clearly some discrimination and negligence and just not the right attitude of some, some communities in the past. Uh, so all of these need to be atta attacked at the same time as we seek to address the poverty and the uh, lack of uh, basic socioeconomic infrastructure of schools, of education, uh, providing for women and youth, uh, particularly generating youth and employment. So the JSN Sahel has this comprehensive approach. In addition to seeking to stand up a force to fight uh, against terrorism and which force, of course, the uh, UN position has been very clear, especially Secretary General and uh, all his adv advisors have recommended that this needs the support of Security Council. Um, and so we still hope that Security Council will come around to uh, authorize, you know, a, a support, direct support to this force. Um, and very quickly, if we shift back to Lake Chad Basin countries, they have also made their own effort in standing up what is called the Multinational Joint Task Force, where the four countries have contributed troops. I must say they have been a bit more even advanced than the JSEN Sahel, which is in a way still work in, project, in progress. The MNJTF has actually been operational with support you know, from Force Balkan, which is deployed in the region, but also from EU in particular, but uh, partners such as US, uh, France, and UK, which have provided bilateral support. Um, and then Nigeria's role there has to be acknowledged, where the initial $100 million uh, was you know, uh, granted from Nigeria. Uh, so there is that uh, effort to, to deal with the, with the problem in the security sense, but for me, the most significant is the acknowledgement that the root causes of this phenomenon of violent extremism and uh, terrorism needs to be addressed. Hence, in the Lake Chad Basin, you now have a regional stabilization strategy which addresses uh, not just the security aspect, but indeed is also looking at how do we ensure that this objective of sustainable development, the SDGs, is actually part of the national programs decentralized to these regions where we are seeing high levels of poverty, uh, low Ill literacy rates, lack of uh, health and other basic uh, facilities that need to be there. And um, now to give it a regional chapeau, we have recently seen the ECOWAS convene a summit on the 14th of September where West Africa as a whole, together with Sahel, and it's significant that for this summit, Cameroon, Chad, and Mauritania were invited. You know, as if to say, this is no longer a problem just uh, exclusive to uh, the Sahel countries, like Chad Basin countries. It's a problem that is threat uh, threatening even coastal states and countries like, you know, Senegal 
and Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana and Togo and Benin are saying, we would like to join hands in tackling this phenomena and you know, in, in, in ensuring a truly regional approach in the fight against terrorism and violent extremism. What I understand you're saying is that the root causes, of course, are not terrorism and jihadism, but governance, poverty, lack of sustainability in development. But when I understood your interventions yesterday and the day before here at this conference correctly, you were basically saying the Europeans and the Americans should engage as strongly, and I understood militarily, as they do in Syria and Iraq. Is that your recommendation, actually? Well, some who will be probably less diplomatic will say that um, until the Libya problem is solved, what we are doing in West Africa and Sahel is maybe just putting a bandage on the wound because they will, they will argue strongly that, uh, and in fact, some of the heads of state in the region often say, we told you to be careful about Libya and you didn't listen. So perhaps as Colin Powell would say, you broke it, you fix it. And until Libya, frankly, is you know, stabilized, that it's a capable state there, and doesn't become a uh, theater where all these groups have free reign and with their different support from, so that's the concern of Sahel and West African states. That yes, it's true that uh, if you look at governance issues and if you look at the uh, neglect of past governments, particularly military governments, in Nigeria it's not a, uh, a secret that most of the military government were led by people from the north and who frankly did not do enough. You know, it shouldn't be the case that you go to Borno and the literacy rate is less than 50%. That's not acceptable in, you know, today. That there, there are not enough schools, no, and you can repeat that of whether it's extreme north in Cameroon or in Chad and you know, um, in the areas of Burkina Faso where you're seeing this phenomenon. There are certain patterns that there was clearly, I mean, 60 years after independence, it shouldn't be that that level of poverty still persists, but it's the reality. And then not to forget even the aspect of women you know, that um, they're not being enrolled in school, the fertility rates are still too high, whether it's in Niger or, or Mali, uh, you know, so all these issues need to be dealt with, but we have to also understand that today, the groups that are fighting there are aligned to international terrorist groups of Al-Qaeda, of Islamic State, it's uh, Islamic State West Africa province claiming attacks in Niger, attacks that uh, led to killing of Americans in uh, northeast of Nigeria, of Borno State, now saying that one of the factions of Boko Haram is fully aligned with Islamic State West Africa province. So there are those internal uh, factors with your know, governance issues that need to be dealt with but our concern is also that these groups are aligned with international terrorist groups. And that's why we say that the same vigor with which these nefarious groups were, were taken on and defeated in Iraq, in Syria, we are not seeing that same fervor, that same vigor. And, but, but we need that on the part of the international community. Thank you, and also for already making the connection to the, to the next theater we are going to move to, and, and also reminding us of the Pottery House principle, which here seems to be redefined in a way who breaks Iraq and who breaks Libya may become responsible for the Sahel and for West Africa. But the connection to the Mashrek, to the region east of the Mediterranean is clear. You, you lined it out, if only by the movement, by the migration, mm -hmm of terrorists who've lost their space or their territorial, um, their territorial dominance in parts of Iraq and Syria. Now, Turkey has been a strong actor in Syria for a long time, but uh, the engagement has changed a little bit uh, last week. 
Um, when President Erdogan first became prime minister, his lead principle was zero problems with neighbors. Um, today, it seems to be the principle of having no zero friends among the neighbors and even zero friends among the international partners and allies uh, Turkey uses and used to work with. Can you explain to us what the Turkish government actually is trying to achieve with its recent, uh, we, we are not allowed to call it an invasion as Europeans because Mr. Erdogan said, if you call it an invasion, we will send you an invasion of refugees. So we call it incursion. So please explain to us what <laughs> Turkish government is about with this incursion. Well, uh, I actually did have two comments about your introductory remarks, but let me take this first and then get back to that. I think it's been, I mean, the Turkish government has been clear on what it intends to do. Two things, and this has been true from the beginning, and this has very broad support in the country. One, there will not be a Kurdish terrorist corridor by the Turkish border. So that has been very clear, very predictable, very consistent from the beginning. So I don't think there's any surprise there. And I think this, in that sense, I mean, if you sort of, you know, we can all sort of think about all convoluted, complex uh, reasoning rationales, but I think that's a very simple statement. And I think it has the full backing of the Turkish people. Well, that's very it is difficult. It is an economic burden, it's a social burden, it is becoming a political burden, and we have to deal with it. And it seems the only reasonable way, as our friends around the world, including those who have these high values, are very reluctant and unwilling to take those refugees, the only way forward is actually to create a safe zone for them so that they can go back or create the conditions in Syria where they can go back. I mean, how we do it, whether uh, you know, we create a better Syria so everyone can go to their original homes would be ideal, but in the absence of that solution, it seems we need in to come up with something. In absence of that solution, you send them to other people's homes. Yeah. No, 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 no. In the absence of that solution, we need to come together mm -hmm. and think of a solution. Because the problem is the default absence of a solution means 3.5 million people living in Turkey forever. So it's, it's a very asymmetric problem. We, as time passes and the community, international community, does not find a solution, the, the burden, the cost, a cruise on Turkey, not on anyone else. A few billion here, a few billion there, yes it helps, but it doesn't really address the fundamentals of the problem. So in response to your question, the two very clear, very predictable, and I think very coherent, consistent principles, objectives, one, no terrorist corridor by the Turkish borders, two, the 3.5 million Syrian uh, guests in Turkey, they need, we need to find a way forward to bring them back to Syria. So those are the two objectives. Two, two additional questions or footnotes to that. The so one is um, everybody calls his adversaries terrorists now in the broader Middle East. So I think we should be a little bit more cautious with the term. Uh, we know about the PKK and its long struggle with Turkey, and we know that the YPG, PYD, has a very, very strong relationship, to say the least, to the PKK. At the same time, it seems to be true that from the SDF, which is now being fought by the Turkish army, no shot has ever been fired into Turkey because they had enough to do to organize their self-administration in the Syrian Kurdish areas. So is terrorism here actually the wrong term to talk about, whereas settling of refugees, which are a burden in Turkey, uh, back into Syria, seems to be um, the, the main background to that, to that uh, incursion, uh, including an, a degree of ethnic engineering uh, in northern Turkey if you settle Sunni Arabs from southern or central Syria to northeastern Syria, which is mainly Kurdish. And the second part of the question, the second question is, you already had, or there already are immediate political effects to the incursion, which is that the Kurdish administration and their militia, the SDF, has now made an agreement with the Syrian army, with the Syrian regime in Damascus, uh, to invite the Syrian army in. Is that in the end the solution also for Turkey, to have the Syrian regime or the Syrian government 
uh, recover its authority over the entire country or most of the entire country and have the Syrian army on the border with Turkey rather than an American-backed Kurdish militia? The first one, the definition of terrorism, obviously it is a universal sort of conversation going on, uh, that, that discussion goes on, but in the Turkish case, the PKK has actually inhabited the Iraqi space and from there attacked Turkey. So for us, the, the idea of PKK in Turkey is, is, is not how we define it. PKK actually inhabits regions that are south of the border, the Turkish border. So for us, the PYD, P, uh, PKK link, which is very real, the fact that you know, it, it hasn't this or that person or this faction within YPG has not taken a shot does not mean much because that is how, we, I mean, we've experienced this for 40 years. We know how PKK functions and how PKK sort of uh, cooperates with, its, uh, with other parties in that region. So it's the kind of risk and the kind of definitional sort of subtlety that the Turkish security sensitivities cannot uh, accommodate. It is just too sensitive because we've lost too many people, 40 years, and we know how PKK functions. And the mere fact that, as you've shared, the link with YPG and PKK is very real, I think that is sufficient uh, for Turkish sensitivity. So that's number one. In terms of ethnic engineering, I mean, ethnic engineering has already taken place. You're an engineer after all. <laughs> well, I was about to say, you know, my CPU works well with integrated circuits, but not with mi the Middle East. It's very, just too complex. <laughs> Even general equilibrium models are fine. It's just Middle East is too much, but I'm trying. Um, the, I, it seems like the Kurds, or, I mean, not the Kurds, the YPG has already done some of that ethnic engineering. So it's really allowing people to come back, arguably. And the second thing is, if there is indeed, I mean, I understand that our European friends are very concerned about demographic shifts, and that's very understandable. And I think that is the point at which our European friends should say, not allowed. If that happens, if that materializes, then the EU will act. But preemptively, saying that this may happen at some point, and then going after the Turkish operation forcefully with sanctions and threat of sanctions, I don't think it's constructive. I do think your concern, your uh, issue about ethnic uh, engineering is a real issue, and the Turkish government, the president himself, has come out and said, no, we are not going to do it, so we can hold him to his promise. And when that happens, if he somehow strays from that very strict rule, then I think our European friends would be rightfully in the position to say, look, we told you we are not okay with this, but we are not there yet, it's not happening. And your other big question is, what's the end game? We don't know. I mean, I, I personally don't know. I can tell you about what I sense will happen. Um, the feeling I get, I mean, I, I understand that they have invited uh, the Syrian government to interfere the Syrian military. But again, this morning, the president says in Kobani and Membij, which is the area where there's a possible uh, sort of conflict with the Syrian army, it, it, that there's cooperation with the Russians, or that Russians are aware of this situation and Russians are cooperating, so it's not going to happen. But my guess is YPG is a tactical instrument for big powers in Syria. I think it was a tactical instrument for the Americans, and I think it may well be a tactical instrument for the Russians. So the Russians, if the, I mean, we know what the Russians want. The Russians want this, uh, Assad and the Turkish, the, the, the Turks to come together so that the, the Syrian, the Syria can be yet again under the control of Assad, and that is the end game for the Russians. So I think they want to steer the whole system towards that direction. In going towards that direction, my guess is, as I said, if the Turkish part, our side, <laughs> does not cooperate fully with that scenario, and there's foot dragging for this or that reason, my guess is the, 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 the our Russian colleagues, friends, will use YPG uh, instrumentally, will try to bring them together with Assad and see whether that can nudge the Turkish side. And looking at the picture, I don't think Turkey can be at odds and can be in conflict continuously with both YPG and the Syrian government. I think at some point we'll have to choose. Uh, I don't know when that point will come. It may be soon, 
And between the lines, I think there is some room for uh, some rapprochement with the Syrian uh, central government, Assad. I and guess that's, we that's have the, thank you very much. I guess we have the answer by next year's World Policy Conference. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Abdelaziz, um, in any, I mean, to, to add another theater to the conflicts we are speaking about, in any confrontation between Iran and either the United States or its neighbors in the Gulf or Israel, whatever, uh, Saudi Arabia would probably be at the receiving end as it already looked when Saudi oil installations were attacked by whoever it was who attacked them. Uh, Saudi Arabia itself has come under closer scrutiny of the international community and also of its friends in the United States, particular in Congress related to human rights issues, the murder of our friend Jamal Khashoggi, the Yemen war, uh, and it seems to have reduced its regional engagement a bit, not in Yemen, but in Syria where uh, also with your participation, Saudi Arabia was very instrumental at some point, very active. Has Saudi Arabia overreached a bit and now is trying sort of to limit uh, its engagement, trying not to get into the limelight of international attention with regard to Yemen and human rights and uh, sort of withdrawing a little bit to uh, trying to mend its own affairs or is that a wrong interpretation? Well, it's a, a bit complex uh, you know, situation, I think. If I, if I look at the current situation in Yemen today, for instance, it is very much directly linked to the conflict with Iran because without the Iranian support to this militia, which is to my surprise how the rest of the world and the community call them the de facto government or reality on the ground. If we are supporting a reality on the ground, a militia that threw a legitimate government and took over, and then we try to endorse those behavior, I think there is something wrong because that's where do you stop and where do you put the limitation there. Saudi agenda today, of course, yes, we were involved in Syria. On the beginning, we tried to help the Syrian people to reorganize themselves. We extended a lot of support with the coordination with the international community. But I think on the Syrian situation, uh, today it's more of the, uh, the, you know, the three level have failed. You know, the direct discussion on the um, Arab, uh, you know, uh, uh, circles have failed. Uh, the, uh, through the OIC, the Organization of Islamic uh, Country have failed also in that one. So it, it went into the international level. And once it is at the international level, it started in Syria as, as a, a, a request for a little bit of a freedom and ended to uh, a platform for a major international conflict zone that you know, everybody trying to exercise uh, their power, their interests on that territory. No, there is no disengagement in Saudi Arabia. I think the engagement is still there. But at the same time, if you look at today to the US agenda, you will say China, Iran, and then North Korea. If you look at the Saudi agenda today, yes, for me, the first priority will be Yemen. I have 1,450 kilo borderline with that. And my second, of course, will be the Iranian aggression sort of uh, you know, policy, interventionist, and expansionist policy that has been adopted to Iran. So I need to deal with that situation as a second priority. Of course, uh, today, uh, um, uh, Iran, uh, Saudi at a very strategic challenge uh, in both border, north and south. Because in the north side, Iran, uh, you know, continuously supporting all the militia group, uh, we call them al-Hashd al-Shahbi in Iraq, uh, uh, which, you know, they're fully, uh, funded, uh, trained, supported by the uh, uh, you know, Iranian Revolution Guard, and at the same time in Yemen. So you know, being in both sides and having the, uh, also in the Gulf water, seeing the threat coming also, I mean, 14th of September is a changing uh, name of the game. You know, if, if the international community today is not condemning a real act, which I think the good thing that Europe at least you know, recognized that despite of the strong relation between Europe uh, and Iran. Uh, I was in New York and I was very happy to hear uh, you know, President Rouhani saying that he would like to have a new Hormuz uh, sort of a regional security uh, framework which will be based in two principles. One is the non-aggression and the second is the non-interventionist. This is what we have been suffering from uh, regarding the Iranian policy. But what I will add to that, that we would like to see an international guarantor, a role for the United Nations to play the guarantor for such a policy 
to be implemented. If they are willing to do and to move toward real implementation of non-intervention and non-aggression, trust me, we will all be happy to, to move toward that regional arrangement. And we do not wish to see more international presence. I mean, somebody like President Trump coming out and say, why do we need to be involved in the Middle East war? We should be out of that one. I think he's mistaken by two things. He has the two strongest uh, you know, enemy and a friend. I mean, uh, Israel is the strongest you know, friend for the United States, and it is within that Middle East uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, geographical location. And Iran, which is his biggest enemy, or the second top in the list for him, uh, is there. So by this engagement or by having uh, 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 you know, double standard in one way, yes, you would draw your, you know, your soldier from the north, Syria, Syria, but at the same time, you're willing to send 3,000 soldiers to Saudi Arabia, yet you will say we have agreed with the Saudi to pay for the cost of that one. You know, if it's really a matter of cost and pricing and so on, maybe we should have an international tender and see who's the cheapest price and come up with the right RFP and then see who will provide the better security at a cheaper rate, you know, if that's the way. It is unfortunate to see such a policy coming out of the U.S. where we would have expected to see a much more real engagement in bringing peace and stability. What the invasion of 2003 into Iraq, did that really brought the stability to Iraq? Are we having a stable, secured, safe, unified Iraq today? We don't. So back to your first question when we start, is the involvement and the engagement of the um, you know, external power, is it in the best interest or the worst interest of the region? It depends how that involvement play roles. I mean, without a uh, uh, withdrawal of Obama, President Obama, uh, 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 red line as he called it, we, ha we would have not seen the Russian back into the region with, with such a strong you know, desire and presence. And today in Saudi Arabia, we are receiving President uh, you know, Putin visit. So uh, you know, that makes it a much more complex scene in, in the region. Uh, uh, so we will still Saudi Arabia. We will they will be involved through the uh, four different layers, of course. You know their uh, own interest. You know with each one of the countries. Second, through the GCC, despite of whatever uh, uh, current situation of the GCC, through the Arab League and through the OIC, and then through the United Nations. So they have all this different you know multi layer. Saudi did condemn uh, the uh, Turkish uh, you know role in the north part of Syria. And they, d despite of that, personally, I understand the interest of the different. I don't think Turkey would have taken such a step without consensus, at least, or uh, I wouldn't call it consensus, but no disagreement from the different strong player in the region, being it Russia, U.S., and the you know, other power there. That could well be. Uh, I mean, you, you already pointed to that, that Saudi Arabia, compared to the to the Kurds and the in Syria have the advantage you can pay for American soldiers, uh, even though not many Saudis have probably fought in the Normandy, uh, and they wouldn't have been co called Saudis at that point. Uh, anyway, um, I, I think there's one important point which I would like to stress, and I don't know how far you want to reveal things. I know that you are involved personally with your research center in second tracks with the Iranians. And um, without going into too much details, you don't want to reveal. W would you see real opportunities for de-escalation and security building across the Gulf based on the contacts you are having with the Iranian counterparts? I think it was very pleased. I mean, WikiLeaks did leak the information, so it's not any more secret, you know, about about our track two, which we have started in 2012. But at the same time, you know, last meeting it was in New York, uh, end of September after the. Uh, 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 General Assembly. Uh, my feeling today, since the Iranian came for the first time, saying yes, we will have a regional security based on the two, you know, principle non-intervention mm -hmm. and non-aggression. I think, uh, you know, with uh, a strong presence of the UN as a guarantor, as I said, it will be welcomed, and I don't think there will be any rejection from the Saudi side, you know, toward that. And uh, we have indicated very clearly, and also when we talked about. Uh, uh, you know, Yemen and how situation will be in Yemen. Um, you know, Iran realized that it is not even in their best interest because they do also have a different militia. They do have, uh, you know, different groups. So if the, if the uh, international community start recognizing the role of the violent non-state actor and giving them a, a, a role to play, where do we stop there? Every country then will have its own problem in that one. But um, 
Am I pessimistic or optimistic? I think it all depends on Iran today. Iran, uh, they, if they realize that they can't live in a leg of hatred in the region, that they need to fix their relation in that one, and they need to address the various issues. They need to address issues from Hezbollah to the militia in Syria that they have created through the Afghani, Pakistani, and the, through the uh, uh, Iraqi also militia. They need to look at al-Hajj al-Shaab in Iraq. They need to look at uh, you know, al-Houthi in, on, the, on the south. If, if they change that sort of attitude and willing to be a response, because they have chosen, by the way, to deal with through this militia for two reasons. One, to support the regime that they want if they decided to, like what they did with Hezbollah in Syria. The second is to leverage with them to use it as a disturbance uh, tools that, you know, the same thing, well, you know, it's like what they did in Lebanon when they have delayed the, you know, uh, uh, the, the government role in that one and became much more uh, aggressive in that one. I think I would still call for a real major constructive global engagement, you know, in solving a lot of the, you know, regional problem that we have starting from Libya all the way to Yemen, uh, you know, going through the, 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 the whole things, yes. Thank you. Uh, let's move to far to the east, to, to, to Beijing. When Abdulaziz just said Saudi Arabia has condemned the Turkish incursion. China doesn't seem to condemn anything, just looking at the situation and enjoying it, I don't know. But um, th th there are no real statements on Yemen, no real statements on the Turkish incursion into Syria. And China seems to wait until opportunities open itself for both economic and more and more of also political and security engagement throughout the region. Economic definitely in Syria and Iraq, security engagement with the UN in, uh, in Sudan, South Sudan, for example. So does China have some ideas of its own and does it want to launch any, in, any initiatives of its own to solve any of the conflicts we have been talking about here? <coughs> I only to express my personal views. Uh, by my observation, I believe China is clo closely watch the whole Middle East and pay attention to the situation, changing situation in Middle East. Uh, today, my main argument is that uh, there will be emergence of a situation of the down in Middle East. Uh, the reason, even though now the currently uh, in international community focused on the Turkish operation in northern Syria and uh, which trigger off the various uh, response towards this incident, uh, but I think the general trend, there will be the trend of the down in the very near future in Middle East. The reasons are as follows. First, United States is the first player actor in Middle East. But let's give a very careful and close look at the behavior of Trump administration. What Mr. Trump wants to do, or what's his priorities, domestically and internationally? Domestically, I think the top priority for Mr. Trump is to win the election of next year. And globally speaking, I think Mr. Trump's attention mainly focused on China. So if his international agenda is a focus on China, that means United States should concentrate enough and necessary resources to deal with China. So let's look at Middle East. I, I believe the resources of United at the U U.S. disposal is limited. If United States wants to concentrate resources to deal with China, that means 
United States has to maintain its interest in Middle East at the lowest cost. Excuse me. Um, we are all good at analyzing the United States. But I, I, we, we I are going to analyze the other actors. We are actually uh -huh. interested in learning about the Chinese priorities and I also, the Chinese I, I, policy. I'll present the Chinese position later on. <laughs> uh, so Don't take too long to, oh, till okay, you come okay. to the Chinese uh, priorities, no. please. Secondly, uh, the, uh, uh, since the United States wants to keep the stability of this regional alliance at the lowest cost, to safeguard the U.S. interests at the lowest cost, that means United States right now cannot do big things in the Middle East. Even though United States cannot do big things in the Middle East, that means United Regional Alliance also cannot do big things because they hope United States to take the lead, to take the leadership, and to uh, contribute more resources. So this is point one. Let's look at Russia. No, Russia. let's look at China, please. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, you, you, you must admit, I squeezed oh, okay, no, my let, let, on me I, let me summarize. Since, since <laughs> you, you don't allow me to <laughs> extend my, my argument, so let me summarize uh, in one word. Various stakeholders in the Middle East, they are all tired, even to some extent. They are exhausted, okay, got exhausted. Russia, United States, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and even Turkey. So they, I think to generalize their wishes as to at least not let the current tension to be get further escalated. So that's uh, laid down a, a great foundation for the situation with Iran. So my recommendations for world policy conference is that international community should catch up this opportunity of Daedan to firstly to hammer out a security framework in Gulf region, in Middle East. Maybe can organize certain kinds of international conference to deplore the possibility and the feasibility of how to let this region more stable, more peaceful. And the second, international community and regional countries should focus on the fight against international terrorism and religious extremism and uh, also ethnic separatism. And thirdly, I think the general key to address the regional peace, stability, and the development is development, is the regional and the trans-regional cooperation. In this regard, China wants to uh, offer its contribution to that within the framework of Belt and Road initiatives and with its cooperation with all Middle East countries. The reality is that China, in fact, keep good relations with all Middle East countries including Turkey, including Saudi Arabia, including Israel, and Iran. Of course, of course, we keep very good relations with all Middle Eastern countries. That, I think, is a, a better conditions to have a, a cooperation with all Middle Eastern countries. And uh, so uh, I, I, I think Chinese position uh, towards the Middle East already Illustrated very clear, clearly by Pre uh, President Xi Jinping during his visit in Egypt in the, and his speech in the uh, headquarters of our league. That is three no's. China seeks seek no proxy in the Middle East, not to seek field power vacuum, vacuum and uh, not seek regime change rather than we uh, persist in our traditional policy, non-interference in other countries' internal affairs. Also, we call for 
United Nations to take, play a leading role to address peace, stability, and development issues in the Middle East. We are also very uh, strongly support Palestinian cause and support the two uh, state solution based on relevant UN uh, Security Council resolutions and uh, with the border before the 1967 war and uh, with Eastern Jerusalem as the capital of a Palestinian state. So we support the Arab Peace Initiative led by Saudi Arabia. We also highly appreciate Saudi Arabia and uh, Arab League's response to the recent, uh, I mean, the so-called deal of century and the uh, Arab positions and Arab Saudi Arabia positions. So this uh, very, very okay. short summarize. Thank you very Thank much you. for laying that out. <laughs> you we, we have uh, 13 and a half minutes to go. Yeah. And uh, so I would invite you to uh, raise your fingers as you already are doing and I would probably take uh, three, four speakers in a row and then give us a chance to you to come back. Would you, the lady here in the front row, would you please ask you, of course, I, I should have, uh, I should have other glasses. Um, Asya, please, uh, you have the first go. Well, thank you very much, you know, for your thoughts. However, I'm so sorry that there is nobody from North Africa because we are having some hot issues too. Uh, let me just ask three or four very quick questions. Please. First to the panel. I would like you please to clarify the respective role of your states, Turkey, of course, GCC, since you have the... Uh, the Gulf uh, think tank, uh, in the first place, the regional powers, what is their involvement in North Africa, the Sahel, and West Africa? And especially in the insecurity continuum from Libya to the Sahel. Uh, second, I'd like to move very quickly to China, since you said to more global powers, since uh, China is taking a more active role in security in Africa. We know it, especially in larger frameworks. But what is the price you would be ready to pay since uh, the US wants it at lowest cost? What is the one you want to pay to see a more stable region, which would be very favorable for your trade? And what type of development would you be respected, respecting since Africa now is looking for a more inclusive, more self-reliant in development. What would be the role of China you know, in that respect? I turn to you, Volker, because I would like to, uh, you to answer me about Europe involvement beyond the role of France. What could Europe do just to contain the risks from inflaming North Africa and further destabilize it, and of course, to try to contain the uh, increase of the immigration flows. On a much wider scope, I would like you, all of you, please, to tell us what would be the game changer to go beyond and avoid organized crime to take roots in the whole region, which it is doing right now, and avoid failing states more in this region of Africa, where states sometimes are much more fragile than the big organized crime. Thank you very much for these very precise questions. I see Joseph, I saw Dorothee and the Dahlia at the very end there. So let's take these three speakers and then we go to the panel. Joseph. Thank you, Volker. Thank you for the panelist discussions and the panelists themselves. Uh, three quick questions going uh, into the debate that you have triggered here. Very interesting. But my first question would be about Palestine, about the Israeli-Palestinian issue. Would, uh, um, shall, I be, um, shall I have to understand that the whole question of Palestine and the Israeli-Arab conflict has become totally irrelevant when it comes to the Middle East? Where do you stand, where do you, the country, your country stand regarding this question? My second question would be to the, the big change that has occurred in the Middle East, which is the role of uh, Russia. We've not been talking very much about Russia, since Russia has this tremendous role that it is playing today in, in, in Syria. Uh, so 
uh, Russia has not welcomed the incursion, like uh, Volker, Volker said, uh, of Turkey. But now, beginning from today, I think that under the, um, the Russian umbrella, Russia would have to well, manage relations with the Turks and with the Iranians. What are the outcome? What are the perspectives about that? And my third question would go to the gentleman from, from Saudi Arabia. Um, and, and a very interesting thing. Do you think, sir, that when it comes to the Iranian and, and the, the tensions in the Gulf area, do you think that today we would be able, I mean, talking about global diplomacy, to solve the problem by focusing only on one part of the problem, which is the nuclear issue? The, the, the European diplomacy is focusing very much on this issue. Don't you think that Iran has been very much successful in setting up a linkage policy that would trigger us or would drive us uh, in order to solve the problems to discuss at the same time nuclear issues, Syrian issues, Afghanistan issues maybe, uh, the Houthis issues, and the Hamas and the Hezbollah issue, since Iran is having a very important role in linking all these questions together. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Joseph. Uh, I have Dorothy Schmidt and Dalia Khatib, yeah. but you already have the mic, so you the start mic. and then Dorothy goes. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm the gentleman from China. He said that the different parties in the region are tired. I don't think so, because if we go back in history, to the history of Europe, to the 30 years war that shattered Europe, and it was also driven by ethnicity, by sectarianism, you know, the, the war stopped only when the different countries didn't have any money or any young people to fight. And we are far away from that. There is still money in the region and there are still young men who are ready to fight. So, and we have this political competition between three blocs, Iran on one hand, Turkey and Qatar on one hand, Saudi Arabia and UAE. Unless we have some serious mediation, what we have, the bloodshed we see now can, can go on for another 20 years. So we need to have a serious effort. We need to have awareness by the regional actors as well by the international community to pressure everyone to enter into an agreement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dorothy Schmidt. Thank you to all the speakers. I'm more uh, interested in the escalation escalation in Syria currently. And so uh, first simple question is who could mediate in Syria? Who should we mediate between? That's a sub question like Turk Kurds, the Turks and uh, Bashar al-Assad soon. Second question, who will reap the benefits of the operation? Which I think personally is extremely risky for the Turks. And third question is, what is your take? This is maybe for you, Volker. What's your take on the future of NATO? So we have, ten, qu we have 10 questions. Uh, I'm not actually a panelist, but I would probably try to say a word in my closing remarks. 10 questions, please don't try to all answer the 10 questions. There would be 40 answers for six minutes. Mm -hmm. So if each of you would, would pick the three questions or so, he seems to be most relevant. And maybe, Mohammed, we start with you again. Yes, um, what would be the game changer in uh, the Sahel and West Africa? And incidentally, the issue that has been raised about uh, transnational organized crime is real, is serious. Um, in uh, the Guinea-Bissau, uh, Senegal area alone, in the last few months, the seizures of of, of drugs uh, has just been phenomenal in terms of the quantities. Um, they're talking of you know more than a ton in one case, uh, 800 you know uh, pounds in another. Case. It's it's huge quantities uh, that are coming through, and there is uh, good reason to believe that this is part of the network for financing of terrorism, precisely because we know the routes of these drugs goes through territories now that are controlled by terrorist groups. So we need to take that serious. And therefore, um, within the perspective of the UN, uh, this integrated approach will call for first and foremost scaling up on the security approach. Um, we all know that MONUSMA was well intended, 
and we're doing our best to use that peacekeeping force in Mali, but legitimate questions are being posed by the Malian people, uh, and it's not making any of us look good. So we need to have serious discussions as to what type of force do you deploy in an area where the adversaries are using uh, what somebody has, uh, someone has called unconventional and asymmetric warfare, terrorist attacks, etc. Do we have the right match of force to the security threat? Legitimate issue to be discussed there. And I've suggested that this cannot be left just to the French, as I think uh, one of the con uh, uh, contributors from the floor has also said, which has deployed Balkan. We know that others are coming on board, but uh, in my view, in uh, not sufficient, uh, vigorous force uh, that we need to deal with terrorism, at the same time that we must address the root causes of poverty and allow this region to harness the tremendous resources that are available uh, to grow the economies, tackle climate change, and uh, change the narrative uh, of uh, violence and extremism to one of uh, creating growth and opportunity for the young people and the women very dynamic, ready to move their countries forward. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Uh, Memdouh, you've got quite a number of I know. precise and short I questions. Know. Very difficult ones. Uh, the Russian issue. Now, I think the criticism of the operation to the, in Syria by the Russians is very contained and sort of subdued. So th that signals quite a bit. Uh, at the end of the day, they managed to put a wedge between the US and PYD. They managed to get US mostly out of it, the, the, the northern Syria. Uh, so they, they're probably quite okay with what's happening, provided they've been very clear about this. They do not want this operation to harm the constitutional process in Syria. They're very clear. They do not want this to harm the territorial integrity and unity of Syria. And they, hence, they do not want a permanent presence of Turkey in Syria. And I think you know, that's very clear, and I think that sort of aligns with the current statements by the Turkish president, Erdogan. So we will hope that this will work out. And, and, it, and in the end, I mean, as, as we were uh, exchanging uh, words with uh, Volker, as, I mean, the, the odds are the Russians will try to nudge Turkey and Syria together for a rapprochement. And that may well be the end game if it happens, but I don't know whether that will happen or not. We'll see. And Iran, I mean, Iran is obviously also sort of watching very closely, and Iran, I think, will be quite okay with that as well, because at the end of the day, both Russians and Iranians seem to be very intent on having Assad rule a, a sort of an integrated, unified country. So that seems to be its heading there. In terms of who negotiates with whom, who mediates, it seems really the only external power at this point that can really mediate is the Russians. Ex unless the Europeans are willing to start talking about the reconstruction effort, which will be a whole other thing, but I don't think we are there yet. Uh, so it's, it'll be, again, I think the Russians will try to do something between us and the Syrians. I don't know whether that will uh, sort of bear any fruit. And if that works out and we finally have our, uh, the corridor free of terrorism, the, you know, the, the, the Syrians gradually going back, the Turks will benefit from this, hopefully the Syrian people will benefit from this. But I agree with you, Dorothea, it is, this will be a very difficult, complicated and risky process. I mean, there is a good scenario going really through these very complex and dreadful scenarios. I'm just hoping that that sort of tenuous line is the one that will materialize in the end. That's, and we'll talk about it next year, hopefully. Thank you, Mamdou. Um, Dong Manian, I think there were two questions which you should answer. The one is the price tag on your engagement. How much are you actually uh, prepared, or you think China is, uh, is prepared to involve in terms of resources? And maybe you should also take the question about who is going to mediate or who could mediate. Uh, I just uh, prepared uh, three points. Point one, uh, China attach greater importance to her relations with MENA region, with Africa. Because in MENA region, except for Israel, all the countries in African continent 
all the countries are developing countries. China is the largest developing country. So first, we share same historical experiences. Second, we face same tasks, how to develop our country, how to better off people's living standards. So we have 1,000 reasons to consolidate, to upgrade our relations, our friendship. So let me determine, let me define the nature of the relations between China with MENA countries, with African countries. That is, we are Habibi Sadihi Ahui. This is my first response. And second response, uh, Palestinian issue. Palestinian just the cause. China, for since the founding of a new China, 70 years ago, and from 50s of next, uh, last century until now, China strongly, persistently, continuously support Palestinian cause. So in, Ar uh, in Arabic, Allah is shuf shuf. So uh, whole Arab world, whole Islamic world are shuvin. What is China doing in terms of uh, support Palestinian cause? So uh, I think currently the whole Arab world, whole Islamic world, face a real challenge. That is how to deal with the so-called deal of the century. Um, I believe even though there is an imbalance of power between Israel and Palestine and between that Israel and that of Arab world, Islamic world, but I think the fundamental interests of Palestinian people, the national dignity of Arab people, Palestinian people, and Muslims cannot be trade off or swap. So China will continue to support Palestinian cause and stand shoulder by shoulder, hand in hand with Arab countries, with Islamic countries to stick to the U relevant UN Security Council resolutions and to support to state solutions and support Arab peace initiative. And the last, the, the third point to the question raised by uh, that beautiful lady about, uh, the, the, because she doesn't uh, believe the regional actors, they, are, they all get tired. I think they get tired, that, that's the one, one of the reasons. More important reason is that Every, I think the main players of uh, in Middle East, their top priority is to how to rejuvenate their country. For you take Turkey as an e example. Turkey under the leadership of type Erdogan Bayi. Turkey formulated 2023rd strategic vision. So I believe Turkey's domestic policies and foreign policies should serve for this strategic vision. And also the same story for Saudi Arabia under the leadership of uh, Crown, uh, Prince, Crown, uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, Saudi Arabia formulated 2030 strategic vision. So that's the, the top priority for Saudi Arabia to realize the, and that will lay the further solid foundation for the leadership of Saudi Arabia in Arab world and Islamic world. So thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. We are already in the negative uh, uh, when it comes to our time schedule. So last remark by Abdulaziz. Well, I'd, uh, maybe I'd like to start by commenting a little bit on the Chinese side, you know, just very quickly, you know, it's okay. Uh, until the uh, China start celebrating their economy post-1991, yes, we used to have a very firm position from the Chinese when it came to 1956, 67, 70 were uh, three, uh, 71, 
And, uh, but post that, you know, I, I mean, lately, unfortunately, we start seeing much more interest from China in the economic side and, and the economic relation, the economic uh, uh, participation in the region. Yes, China import today uh, 1,550,000 barrel a day from Saudi Arabia. Almost 17% of China import comes from Saudi Arabia, which is a very important. I myself take a lot of uh, pride that I was one of the very few Saudi visited China in November 1980, when it was a different country at that time. But at the same time, what today might concern me, the Chinese have followed the Russian when it came to the Syrian case. They have joined them in the veto that have on the Security Council without stating their clear position, you know, away from the Russian, you know, following them on such a decision and so on. But anyhow, um, it's a very important relation. We appreciate a lot of the Chinese position there, but yet we don't like to see a buyer and seller relation only with China. We would like to see a much more, you know, uh, holistic approach and a much more constructive approach from the Chinese. Um, Yes, the, the questions from the floor. From yes, the floor, I will, I will go th th through it very quickly. Uh, with regard to the um, um, uh, North Africa and the Sahel, well, w when it comes to a country like Libya, Saudi Arabia would like to see a unified Libya, a constitutional that, you know, take in consideration everybody. Uh, some of the Gulf country have taken uh, a step of intervention there. Uh, I'm not so sure whether it's based on their own interest or based on another alliances they have you know, uh, with other country, but at the same time, I can't speak on their behalf. I can, I can see that, yes, Egypt and, and UAE is involved in Libya, Qatar and Turkey is involved in Libya. I think if we leave the Libyan, uh, you know, issue to the Libyan and we try to help them to come up with, a, you know, a much better structure will be better. In the Sawahil, yes, we are a big supporter for counterterrorism issue, and Saudi have contributed to that, and we understand, you know, the situation uh, there quite well. On the Palestinian, no, it will remain to be the key issue in the region. I don't think, you know, the Palestinian is coming down in the list. Maybe there are, you know, it used to be the only case, the mother of all cases and the mother of all battles, as they call it. But now we have many different cases at the same time. We have, you know, many issues to deal with, but that would not because otherwise, you know, when we had the Arab summit in Dammam in Saudi Arabia, King Salman called it the, you know, Al-Quds summit. Saudi continue to support the you know, um, you know, Palestinian government with no changes there. Are we in support, not in support, uh, you know, with, the, with the, uh, the deal of the century? I was one of those who met with Kushner when he came to Saudi Arabia and when we talked to him. I don't think there is a real clear picture at this stage today that you can really judge whether the deal of the century has a clarity or not. Um, Russian role, as I said, you know, uh, I, I will close it, don't worry. Uh, you know, Russia's role, as I said, if it wasn't uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, declining, I mean, Russia will have their own difficulties. The, the Russian economy is almost the same size of uh, Spain. Can they really afford that expansionist policy? Th their trade relation with the region is primarily in military and some mineral, but not much. It's not like the Chinese. For instance, you will compare a three billion China, I mean, uh, Russia trade with the region to uh, almost 170 billion from China. You know, that's a big difference uh, on that one. Uh, uh, Abdelaziz, last, last word. We are getting signs that we are uh, taking over time. Can we really solve the nuclear issue? Uh, you know, there is two, two divisions. There is the strategic and the non-strategic issue. The non-strategic issue, we are willing to continue with the Iranian. Hajj, Umrah, diplomat, establishing the relation, organized crime, uh, you know, uh, um, maritime issue. In you know, all of these issues, we differentiate. The key issue, strategic issue for us, that we will not compromise about it, is their interventionist policy, their expansionist policy, and the JCPO, which include the missile program. The Iranian, they used to insist in linking them all together, but today, according to the last statement from President, I mean from uh, Minister Zarif, he's willing to separate, he's willing to deal on the both uh, side. The last word, thank you. Uh, I mean, we need to thank the great country of uh, Kingdom of Morocco for their hosting us and providing the platform. We need to thank Terry and all his team, uh, uh, you know, for, for organizing the world policy. We're very happy with what we see. This is becoming the Davos of the international affairs. Thank you for already sort of making the last words here, which usually uh, belong to the chairperson. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not a hijack, I'm, don't I'm worry. Not going, 
I'm not going to answer the NATO question because that's not the panel on Asia's question. Would be great to have a panel on European engagement with this region. My very short answer is containment is not an answer. Uh, our strategy would, would, should be a mix of continuing transformative engagements plus empowerment of the states that work and function in the region, but that would need more time to elaborate. Uh, please join me in thanking these four gentlemen here for enlightening about the situation in that region. And that was it. Thank you.